Disa conferred by Western Cape Premier Ibrahim Rasul and also the Reconciliation Award conferred by the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation. Mary, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for introducing me. It was very nice, very kind of you. And thank you to everybody for coming. I look forward to some discussion with you as we talk about the prospects of reconciliation um, for the future in South Africa. But I'm particularly reminded, especially after those dates that we went through, that it's 20 years now since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was embarking on its second year of existence. And 20 years ago, we were racing like mad to try and complete the work that had to be done we were preparing two public hearings, two of the very important public hearings of victims' testimonies, one in Duduza and one in Craddock, both of them very memorable public hearings. And I've been transported back into that time and thinking about the work of the TRC. During those two years, many of you will remember, South Africa went through an extraordinary process as we listened uh, we listened on the radio, we watched on television, we read the daily newspapers of this account of so many thousands and thousands of people who suffered in the conflict years before apartheid came to an end. People on all sides of the political spectrum, events that some of us knew about and many events that people did not know anything about. And it was a very painful time for most of us. Um, and so, at the end of it, we have to really try and think what, what was it all about and what did it achieve as we look at ourselves now 20, 20 years later. Those, those public hearings were, I think, one of the signature themes of the Truth Commission. Um, no other Truth Commission had done quite the same thing before, uh, put people up for public testimony and have special hearings also into the institutions that had somehow created the kind of society in which those things can happen. So there were testimonies heard all over the country in big cities and in small places where people talked about sufferings of the, uh, abuses of their human rights. In terms of the Truth Commission legislation, gross violations of human rights, which were defined as killings, torture, abductions, and disappearances. And those things were carried out, those actions were carried out by people who were acting as agents of the state uh, or people who were within the structures of the liberation organizations who supported them. And in order to qualify for the TRC's processes, there needed to be some political motive for those actions, not simply a criminal motive. So the whole question was really a political process. But we have to remember how the TRC came into being at all. And if you look a little bit further back to the announcement by President de Klerk of the changes and then the um, coming into power of the ANC with President Mandela at its head in 1994 and how that all came about. Between 1990 and 1994, we lived through the months and months of agonizing discussions of CODESA as it tried to work out the interim constitution for South Africa. And the discussions went along and every now and then they broke down, usually because of some dramatic event or a conflict that could not be resolved. And at the very end, towards the end of 1993, there was a demand, especially from right-wing groups, for an amnesty. And for many of us in our society, and for many people who support the concepts of justice and proper processes of justice, the concept of amnesty seemed unbearable. And yet, it was resolved at the last minute that in order to get the interim constitution accepted, an amnesty would be offered. So then the question was, what kind of process would be followed to grant an amnesty? 
in some of the countries that were predecessors to South Africa's TRC, there had been a general amnesty granted without any individual names being specified and people being punished. And there were many people in South Africa who felt that we could do more than that. That we had a stable government now, the um, ANC was, had taken over the reins of government uh, with considerable support and considerable relief from those parties who had previously supported the old government to find that the country remained stable and democratic. And so, after many discussions and the drawing up of the legislation, it was agreed that there would be an amnesty, but it would be matched by hearing the stories of the people who had been the victims of the actions for which amnesty would be, would be sought. And so, the Truth Commission was then established in 1995 with one arm to grant amnesty and another arm to listen to the testimonies of the victims. Altogether, more than 20,000 people came to speak to the Truth Commission, about 22,000. And of those, about 2,000 had the opportunity to speak in public. So the public hearings were only the tip of the iceberg. But we did our best to make sure that through those processes, people's stories were heard from all ages, from men and women, from young and old, and from different part sides of pre South Africa's previous history. So part of the objective of finding the truth was through the process of people who applied for amnesty. Because one of the conditions for amnesty was that you had to make a full disclosure of what you had done and what um, your political motive had been and who else might have been involved in the planning or the ordering of carrying out such an act. And although the amnesty applicants were cautious and they came in rather slowly, when they did come, they opened many stories which had previously been closed to public knowledge and particularly which had been closed to those people who had suffered from those actions. The other aspect of the truth-telling came, of course, from the testimonies of the victims. And I think that when one looks at the Truth Commission and tries to evaluate what it achieved, you can say that it did reasonably well on the truth side. Um, we learned a lot, and many doors were opened, which I think will continue to expose windows into, into the past. That certainly has been the experience in other countries, that 20 years, 30 years later, people come forward to confess something that they couldn't bear to do at the time or to shed greater understanding and knowledge of how, how things worked. The Truth Commission also had a third arm. There were three major committees to the TRC. So there was Amnesty, the Gross Human Rights Violations Committee, um, and the Reparations and Rehabilitation Committee, which dealt with making recommendations as its first task on what should be done in terms of reparations and rehabilitation and reconciliation. But they also did a great deal in the way of counseling the people who were going to testify, of helping to find both medical and psychological uh, assistance for them if it was required, and doing a great deal of the support work as people went through the rather traumatic process of, of telling their stories. The truth was also found through other units in the Truth Commission, a research division and an investigation division. And uh, the research commission, committee would uh, look, for, look through our recent history, look at places and events which might need further investigation, even if did, people did not come forward initially of their own accord. So we tried not to miss out on any of the important stories of the past. Uh, and the investigations unit made, uh, also did some very important independent investigative work at its own initiative, but it also followed up the stories that were told in order to corroborate their truth. We did not want ourselves to be duped by people telling stories which are not true, and we also didn't want people to run the risk of perjuring themselves by making an allegation, for example, that a particular person had been responsible for what happened to them when they might make a mistake. So the investigative unit would follow that up. 
And that does mean that we can vouch for the veracity of the stories that were told and for the public record that is there. And it was often really fascinating to see how um, documents had been kept in many places. You could follow up a police day book and find that the person who had told you that she had been arrested and uh, badly abused while she was held in police sales, cells, um, that that was recorded. Not the abuse, but the fact that she had been in the police cells over those days. So we could say that that is absolutely the truth. I remember one particular occasion with a wonderful woman in Beaufort West who um, was challenged because the story that she told was recorded in the day book, but for the subsequent year. And she sat back in her chair and she said, I'm not an educated person. If you say that it was 1987, that must be right. You know? And it was so obviously a truthful reaction to the story that the people who doubted, there were many people who said it's a bunch of lies and people are coming forward for all sorts of um, uh, reasons of expectation of compensation and so on, that this was such a, an absolutely natural reaction to the situation. And then there is an ongoing part of the truth because investigations have continued. And there is, for instance, a wonderful unit called the Missing Persons Task Team who have been, for all the years since the Truth Commission came to an end, finding out more and more about people who disappeared. Um, they have already discovered and exhumed over a hundred bodies and returned the remains to their families. And there are still some pending DNA identification. And one of the people heading up that team, Madeleine Fullard, who was in the research unit for the Truth Commission, has written a book about it. And I hope maybe it'll be out in time for her to come and talk at next summer school. It's absolutely amazing. And they have worked with international experts um, in uh, excavating human remains in different countries and doing, carrying out this work meticulously carefully. It has been really a remarkable task. Um, and also, families who did not receive the kind of information they wanted to, or not as full as they wanted to, through the TRC process, have continued to demand processes of justice. Um, and for a long time, there was very little action. But just this past year, um, in the case of Nokutula Simelane, uh, a prosecution is being brought, apparently, against four people who were granted amnesty by the TRC for the kidnapping of Nokutula Simelane, but not for her killing because there was no, they did not apply for having killed her, but somebody killed her. And so those four people are now going to be charged with murder. And it will be very interesting to see whether there is sufficient evidence to convict them, whether they are in fact guilty. Um, and uh, that's thanks to the ongoing work of her family but also of lawyers and legal organizations and investigative organizations who have not let go of this process. So, okay, we, are, we can claim to be doing reasonably well in terms of the truth. Reconciliation is not so easy. Um, that R&R um, &R committee did wonderful work, made extensive recommendations in the final report of the TRC, um, and did a great deal of facilitation work, particularly with people who had come forward to make an amnesty application, but who sought also forgiveness. Um, co making a confession and an apology and a request for forgiveness was not a condition for receiving amnesty. And I think it's a good thing that it wasn't, because people would simply have gone through the motions and made an apology if it had been a condition. It did mean that when people did apologize and seek an encounter with the families of the person for whom, whose death they had been responsible, for example, um, were sincere in wanting that. But it was a very tricky thing to handle. And the members of the r, &R committee, many of them skilled in either medical or psychological work, were wonderful at bringing about some of those encounters. But the recommendations were what everybody was waiting for at the end of the TRC's life. And there are about 50 pages of them in the, in the TRC report. 
But of course, the one that people were most interested in was the question of reparations. And although at the beginning of the TRC's life, we had not known whether there would be any possibility of a financial part of a reparations package, in fact, the TRC recommended it in the end. Um, and that was something that then the people who had been found to be victims had a legitimate expectation that they would receive something um, in compensation. But what happened was that the government took more than four years, nearly five years, to debate the recommendations. And when they eventually did, some of the people were old or injured and had died. Um, people had moved away from their places where they lived and were difficult to track down. And the people who were in contact and aware of what the recommendations had been were deeply disappointed, not only that the government decided to give much less than had been recommended, but also at the way that they had been left to wait without any recognition. And one of the things that we have learned is that on the road to healing, acknowledgement of people's suffering and what they went through is a public acknowledgement, and especially an official acknowledgement, seems to be a very important part of that process. And this, our government did not do fully at that time. So, and now, of course, all these years later, there's a whole new generation which doesn't really remember that process anyway and sees no reparations for the apartheid suffering and feel that they, so many years after a new government, have not seen the changes that they had hoped for. So you have the disappointment of the actual people who were injured and looked to the TRC for um, some kind of redress. And there are the young generation who don't really have any high regard for the TRC, but still have plenty of claims to make about redress for past <coughs> injustice. And I think although it's not part of our South African name for the commission, the question is also how did we do on the justice stakes? And some of the subsequent commissions that have been set up in other parts of the world have specifically named their commissions truth and justice commissions um, and have parallel systems rather than have the amnesty and the victims um, processes together. So we haven't done very well on the prosecutions. Only recently have there been um, these very few that are coming up. There have been very few resources allocated to the uh, National Prosecuting Authority for that particular process, even though the TRC had given many of its um, unresolved cases to be, to be followed up. And then, um, later in 2002, President Mbeki pardoned some of the people who had been denied amnesty. And even later still, tried to set up a new pardons process which would enable more people to be pardoned. Well, that new process, which uh, required uh, a whole new committee who would be looking at the cases by cases, was taken to court by um, families and legal firms, and the Constitutional Court declared it an unconstitutional process. So that remains, that, that question of pardons remains hanging in the air still. So, the TRC couldn't, it wasn't set up to carry out justice, but what it did have was a legitimate expectation that of the cases that did not grant, were not granted amnesty, or the people who we know carried out gross human rights violations, but did not come forward to seek amnesty, should have been open to further prosecutions. And that, that has not really happened. So, some success with truth, not, not so much with, with reconciliation, and a new generation to whom all that is in the past. So they ask, where is the redress? Where is the transition which was dreamt of 20 odd years ago? The new challenge is more than reconciliation. People don't really want to talk about reconciliation anymore. Even redress has become a word that is overused and people don't really understand exactly its significance. The new word seems to be restitution. But even restitution is difficult to know how you manage to make up for all that was lost during the centuries 
of informal apartheid and then formalized apartheid. Um, in October uh, last year, there was a very interesting conference called the Restitution Conference and held symbolically at the Cape Town Castle. And it was a most fascinating discussion on a whole range of spheres, land dispossession, education, language rights, employment opportunities, and distribution of wealth. Uh, the, the conference was divided up into different uh, small workshops, and there were amazing discussions and a great deal of heat and anger generated and a number of uh, suggestions put forward um, on so many fronts that there's an enormous amount of work to be done still. And there, there, a report will come and be published of that conference uh, and I'm sure a new work will go forward arising from it. Just before the conference, uh, Charlene Swartz, who works for the Human Sciences Research Council, but is also um, a member of the Restitution Foundation, and they, those two organizations together were responsible for the conference. Charlene published a book called Another Country, Everyday Social Restitution. Um, and it's, it's a very valuable resource book for people who want to work in, in this area. And I think that one of its um, useful attributes is that it suggests a whole number of small and larger ways in which people can work towards restitution in their own lives, in their own communities, without um, revolutionary changes in their lives. Now, it may mean that maybe that we need revolutionary changes in our lives, but we can at least start with, with some of the small ones. Um, she defines the concept of social restitution as being actions and attitudes that everyday people can undertake. And she looks at four different ideas. One of them is that injustice and ongoing resentment about injustice damages all our humanity and continues over a long time. And for me, that means that it is all in the interests of all of us to work on restitution issues. Then she says that a broad understanding of restitution is a helpful tool for change and argues that we need a new language for it beyond the labels of victim and perpetrator. And that echoes with some of the work that um, people like uh, Mahmoud Mandani have done who argue that the Truth Commission by focusing on perpetrators and victims let most of us who are beneficiaries of the past off the hook so that people don't feel a sense of responsibility for the past. She also um, defines restitution as being aimed at restoring dignity, opportunity, belonging, and memory. And that sh it should include financial, symbolic, and practical acts. And then, as I say, lastly in the book, she says there is something for everyone individuals and communities, along with government institutions. And that the best way to devise action is to decide together in dialogue across previous divides. And her book contains a, a final chapter of things that people can explore and carry out alone or together with small groups or larger organizations. But one of the people at the conference was a very interesting man uh, called Chepo Mandlingozi. He is a respected academic, I think, from Pretoria. And he is also the uh, chairman of the board of uh, the Kulumani organization, which represents the interests of people who were victims of gross violations, um, who either fell through the cracks of the Truth Commission, never managed to get a chance to come and testify there, or who have experienced things which perhaps didn't fall precisely within the definition of the, of the TRC, but who remain deeply aggrieved at having been left outside of the process and not having had any experience of redress. And um, Manlingozi is apparently, uh, I must confess that I haven't read his, his, the, his full writings, but he is known to be addressing 
uh, the question of transitional justice and what it means for societies coming out of a period of conflict with a focus on justice as well as transitional. And he says that the conversation about restitution is recalibrated away from what white people see as restitution. And he argued very strongly that conferences and discussions should emanate from a black person's view of what restitution is. Um, it does not mean assimilation. It does not mean being accepted into or through a process of what white people see, see as being necessary for restitution and reconciliation. And I think that means that for many of us, we need to learn to stand back and listen a bit more than, than we do. And it's wonderful to have somebody who is recognized um, for his intellect and his argument, as well as for bringing that perspective. It does make me think, though, about whether there are lessons to be learned from the TRC process. Because one of the things that seemed to be vital, if in, especially in those cases where there was an opportunity for an encounter between victim and perpetrator, which you could say was a little model of what reconciliation might mean, was that there were certain conditions that seemed to have to be fulfilled before forgiveness can be even thought about. And one of them is that question of acknowledgement. Public acknowledgement by the state, by an official body like the Truth Commission, um, being recorded in the annals of history, having your story recognized as being the truth. And if it also comes with an acknowledgement from an individual perpetrator who acknowledges what he or she has done, um, recognizes the truth of it and the wrong of it, and, and seeks to make amends in some way, that acknowledgement itself is important. If it comes with an apology, better still, either an official apology um, or an apology from an individual to an individual. And lastly, we found that what really peop made people able to accept an apology was a willingness to make atonement in some way. So that I remember the, the mothers of a, a group of young men who were killed through a security police trap set for them, basically. Um, who were then approached by one of the policemen involved in that action um, who wanted to make an apology. And so an occasion was organized by the Truth Commission to bring uh, four of those mothers, I think they were, they were more than that altogether, but I think four of them came to the meeting, and this young man who apologized. And no, no, it's the Google Letter 7. Um, and um, so it's a Cape Town, Cape Town event. And um, the, the policeman was very, quite young, and he, it was he who had exposed the fact that this was a police action. Um, whereas when we had heard about it in the, in the newspapers at the, at the time that it happened, it looked as if it had been an ambush by these young men of a police vehicle, but actually it had been planted in their, in their planning. Um, and it was this policeman's story which had cracked the TRC's ability to tell that story and all the subsequent things that have been said about that event. And the, so, so we from the TRC point of view felt that here in a way was somebody who fulfilled the condition in that he had enabled those families to receive the truth of the event. And however, the mothers looked very silently at him as he made his, his very emotional apology. And um, then one of them said, yes, I, I can forgive you. And she, she uh, articulated it with a religious motive. She said, Jesus taught us that we must forgive, so I will forgive you. And she then embraced him and the other mothers followed. And it was because He'd made the apology, he'd made the, um, the, the uh, acknowledgement of, the, of, of what had happened, and he had given them the knowledge that they wanted. So there was that act of atonement as well. And there were many other cases where 
an encounter like that worked because it seemed that those conditions were met. And then in other cases, there were many encounters that did not work and were really quite risky because the family was not in a place where they were ready to forgive. So not all that easy to do. So was the TRC a waste of time and money? Did little more than just permit the moment of transition from apartheid to democracy? I must confess that there were many times during the life of the commission that I thought so. That the, the governments, the, the people representing different sides of political parties needed to get the new constitution finished. They needed to deal with that political requirement for amnesty that was being pushed onto them and we were given the task of carrying it out. Um, and it was only really because of the insistence that we should do more than grant amnesty, uh, that, which I think redeemed the TRC. But still, um, th I think there are, there are criticisms that can be made of that kind of compromise. On the other hand, all transitional justice mechanisms are some kind of a compromise like a peace treaty after a war. There is no way that every side will get what it wants. And so maybe the compromise that we made was the one that was best for South Africa. Um, there was plenty of truth uncovered and more will come. Reconciliation was not perfect, but we're going on looking for it. The justice was not perfect, but we have a fine constitution and an independent judiciary. And so although it's criticized so widely by most South Africans, we have to see that our commission was as widely respected in other parts of the world. There have been more than 20 similar commissions established in different countries since then. Many of them have sought to learn from the Truth Commission. Many of them have taken some of our commissioners to work in their countries with them as they devise the mechanisms that are the best for them. And then there are countries involved in terrible conflicts which don't have even a hope of establishing a truth commission at this stage and who long for the conditions which would allow them to embark on building that kind of bridge between parties involved in conflict. So I think that the, the, the task, oh yes, and of course we see that, that here at UCT, uh, students and management have entered into an agreement to have something like a truth commission process to see whether that can bring conflicting views um, to reach some kind of accord in these coming months. So there's something about truth commission processes that gives one hope for a way out of what seems like an insoluble situation. But I think that our task as a country is not finished and it won't be finished until we handle this restitution question. Restitution not only for individual acts of abuse and suffering, but for a whole way of changing the opportunities that all our citizens have. And that means, well, I think first of all, it means education, basic education right starting from childhood. And we have got to get the education system right before we have any hope of providing the kind of um, job opportunities and life experiences that will make all our citizens equal citizens. It's not enough having democratic processes. We have to iron out the poverty and inequality which still bedevil South Africa. So I hope that you have questions and, and ideas and that we can enter into some discussion about where we are on our national journey. Thank you. Yes. Young people are looking for right 
Um, the, qu the question is, what, what has become of a special fund to be established to try and do some of this um, reconciliation work? And within the Truth Commission, we spent a long time de debating whether there should be a wealth tax. And at the end of the, of the life of the main part of the Truth Commission, and in its major, uh, the main part of its report, there is no reference to a wealth tax because it was regarded as, as possibly too controversial. And um, some people who were in touch with the private sector said, well, the business uh, sector is already going to uh, establish some kind of a fund. And so it was left. But by the time the last two volumes of the Truth Commission report were published a couple of years later, um, there is included in that a recommendation, a later recommendation, that there should be a wealth tax. And it has never been taken up. By, by the government as, as an idea. Um, I think people are afraid of, of resistance and opposition. But I'd, I think that symbolically, it would be a very powerful thing to do. And of course, we, the government needs the funds desperately to do that sort of work. Um, I think possibly it might have to be an independently run fund with, with a clear uh, objective rather than simply going into the into the tax base because I think there might be some resistance to that and I just think that uh, as I said at the beginning it would be better for all of us our lives would be better we would live a happier more positive probably more peaceful and maybe even less crime ridden life if we were addressing some of the ills of the past and a special fund to do that would be a, a powerful force you know? Yes. But when you said now wealth fund, yes. that's, that's, that's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Kind of. yes. And I think it is an important thing to do. Um, at the time when we tried to get people to make some kind of commitment in 2000, I think it was perhaps too early. And I think we probably couched it wrong because we were asking people to acknowledge the benefits that they received from their past, white people to acknowledge the benefits they had received from their whiteness. I still think that's an absolutely legitimate thing to do, but it was interpreted by the media as being a say sorry fund. And that was not the objective. It was not requiring an apology, but it was recognizing that all of us, I mean, I look at my grandchildren whose opportunities in life are so hugely greater than those of children who are not white. Everything, the way they were brought up, the schools they went to, the kind of heritage that they have, places them in an advantaged situation. How are we going to get that back, back to, to reach everybody if we don't work really hard at it? And I think of, of people who, who have young families who are leaving this country and, and trying to give them opportunities elsewhere. Well, I don't know what it costs to do that, but it must cost an awful lot to move to a new country, dig up your family, leave your other parts of your family behind, so there's an emotional cost, and a, a really expensive thing to do, which only the very wealthy can manage. If they were plowing that money back into our society, maybe they wouldn't have to go. <laughs> they could spare themselves all the tra trauma of it. Um, it's a, hard, it's a hard message to get across, though, because it makes people feel defensive. And, and we just need to talk about it more and talk about the advantages of, of it. And maybe people who have little should give what they can give, and maybe that will be an example that can inspire and shame others into doing the same thing. Yes, sorry, and then I'll come back to you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you. Yes. 
still be taken up I, th I think you're right. I think the, the question is about whether the religious organizations could be the spur to, to uh, bringing all that into a central way of, of offering some kind of restitution. Some of, the, some of the religious organizations have done wonderful things and continue to do wonderful things. And one of the things I think is that many organizations and uh, religious organizations and, and secular ones and individuals do do a great deal. And many of them hide their lights under the bushels. Uh, whereas I think that maybe we do need to move away from our rather stiff upper lipped way of being generous and, and be more proud of it and talk more about it. I know people who give enormously generously to, to many good causes, but they don't want their names made public because they like many of us were brought up that you don't do that sort of thing. But it's an inspiration to others. And maybe we should think about changing that rather whiteness aspect of our lives. Um, I think it's a good idea to try and bring the different denominations together and work on some kind of concerted project. I think the time is urgent, and I'm sure the churches recognize that. And maybe that kind of common, common work I think we probably all rather miss the, the way that the regional councils of churches used to work during the struggle years to do all sorts of combined things. And now everybody has tended to return to their denominational home. Um, so I do think that, that there's scope for that. Thank you. So the question is, what is transitional justice and what about restorative justice? Transitional justice has become the, the terminology for any process of justice, of working out a justice mechanism to deal with atrocities that were occur occurred in conflicts of the past. So whatever country it's in, it's, it's whether it's the army or whether it's an invading army or whether it's conflicts between different groups in a, in a country. And so whatever mechanism is chosen, whether it's um, a, a, an open process like a truth commission or whether it's a judicial process that, that carries out trials against people, um, all of those fall under the heading of transitional justice. Um, restorative justice was something that was talked about a great deal and during the, the, the TRC time. And it argued that maybe if, you've, if you could not do the, tr the traditional forms of justice, if it was not possible to prosecute everybody who had carried out abuses, that some form of restorative justice would at least make up to those who had most suffered by restoring something to them. Um, I, think, I mean, I think it could work, but it has, I don't think it has worked in terms of, and there also there were arguments that what are you trying to restore? People's lives under apartheid, they didn't want that restored. They wanted something very different restored. So that's why these words like restorative justice and redress and re reconciliation continue to be conflicted words. Um, but definitely the idea is that if you cannot manage our traditional concept of justice with a proper law, uh, legal process, then you can find other ways of effecting some kind of justice for people. But obviously there's a lot of criticism leveled at it in all sorts of ways. And I'd just like your opinion please on two, two of those. And the first is that the TLC was under such time pressure, two year time frame and then was extended to three, I think, it didn't come anywhere near to being able to achieve everything, that you allowed yourselves to be distracted by some investigations that did not actually fit the legal mandate. And I say that particularly around the investigation into big business, for example, the business hearing. Business sharing is up to business up to eyeballs, obviously, as part of the apartheid structure. Some, probably some terrible, many terrible abuses in business. 
but not within the legal framework of what constitutes gross human rights violations. That's the one thing. And the other is that there was some allegation that the TRC wasn't always entirely even-handed. The example there, for example, that when the ANC submitted documents as part of the investigation into the political parties, not all of those documents were made public. The TRC allowed some of those submissions to be kept private, kept secret, and as far as I know, they still are, for example, over some of the reporting of the abuses of the camps. <coughs> why, why were they not made public as well as part of finding the real truth? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, the question of the, the special hearings. All, uh, the, the special hearings were an attempt. Um, when we recognized the, the reality of the criticism that by focusing on individual victims, we were not portraying the reality of the whole society and how the whole society enabled um, those abuses to take place and people were complicit or ignorant about uh, what had happened. And so we looked at various different sectors of society and held hearings into the judiciary and the media and the business sector and the health sector, um, trying to think of others. And um, the, the point of them was not to, to find a, a perpetrator, but to record the way in which those institutions in our society had been complicit. Uh, so it wasn't a question of trying to prosecute or, or pursue a, an amnesty application or anything like that. It was meant to provide this wider picture. And I think maybe it was being ultra-sensitive to the criticisms of the TRC as focusing on, on victims and perpetrators. Um, I think it was also, certainly I myself thought that when the Truth Commission was established, um, it was already at a time when the government was establishing the Human Rights Commission, the Gender Commission, the Youth Commission, um, and the Land Commission. And I thought that all these commissions would more move together like a raft, dealing with all these different aspects of injustices of the past. And what happened was the TRC had a very charismatic chairperson and a highly active and efficient deputy chairperson and a huge budget and a short lifespan and it attracted enormous publicity, and it, it looked as if all the hopes for the future were all poured into the TRC, as if it could fix everything. And maybe those hearings were a bit of an, our attempt to try and fix everything. Um, some of them were very unwieldy, some of them were unsatisfactory because we didn't have any capacity to make people come and speak at them and so on. Um, the question of difficulty of being even-handed I must confess that I don't remember a discussion about whether um, it was legitimate to allow the ANC not to reveal those documents. I think in general our experience was that uh, we got an overwhelming amount, maybe more than we could cope with from the ANC because it had had its own commissions and so on. But no doubt there was all sorts of other things that were, were not revealed at the time and some of which have been and come out subsequently or trickled out through individual testimonies. Um, and, you know, I think you might find that all the political parties probably tried to put forward the best face that they could at the hearings. So um, I think the, the, the difficulty in a way, talking about even-handedness, was right at the end of the Truth Commission with the challenge from President de Klerk about the finding made against him, and then the challenge from the ANC uh, against the findings made against the party. And both of them tried to prevent the publication of the report. Uh, and both of them, well, in, in President de Klerk's face, an arrangement was made. And in the ANC's case, they lost their court case against the TRC. So at that stage, we thought, well, at least we must have done, been fairly even-handed if everybody was furious with us on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, it was a constant quest to try and be even-handed, I must say. Yes.
Yes. Yes, I, I think that um, the whole process would have been enormously enriched if some significant people had, or more significant people, had made public apologies. And of course, there is the, the, the famous story about President de Klerk himself, because uh, they, they made, he made the, the first presentation to the TRC of, of the National Party's uh, policy and experience, and he talked about the cruelty that, that it had, apartheid had imposed on people and recognized that. And then there was a second hearing when the parties were called back to answer questions about the reports that they had tabled. And that's probably where they might have asked more questions of the ANC, I suppose. Um, but I, I was not sitting officially at that particular hearing of the National Party's presentation, but we had in our offices in town, we had television monitors up and down the corridors in, uh, where you could watch what was going on. And I happened to be going past one down the corridor when I heard President de Klerk, ex-President de Klerk, he was already then, um, make the most generous apology that I've ever heard for apartheid. Over several sentences talking about uh, and the suffering it had caused and the hardship it had caused and the injustice and so on. And I thought, at last, this is a huge breakthrough. And I was so encouraged by, by this completely it sort of changed my day. That, and I didn't know was that the next thing was that Archbishop Tutu tried to press him to take, make a personal apology. And I think Alex Borain also tried to press him to make a per personal recognition of his responsibility as a member of cabinet when many of those things were happening. And he could not take that step. And I suppose you can understand why, really, in many ways. But a person with a little bit more um, I don't know, greatness might have been able to do it. And I think it would have changed the flavor of the TRC. And I think many more people would have come forward to seek amnesty because they would have felt that recognition of the ultimate cabinet responsibility for what happened. Whereas many of the people who had been police agents and who came to seek amnesty or, or military, but there were fewer of the military, Many of them felt they had been hung out to dry by their party um, and that they had been um, portrayed as evil individuals and not part of a system, whereas they saw themselves as carrying out orders as part of a system. Um, and that, I think that would have set a different tone. Then I also felt that some individual people um, who were well known who, if they had been able to come forward and make an apology, that it would make a difference. And one of them was Robert McBride. And after I had already said that somewhere, and I'm sure he didn't know about it, but um, he was one of the people who did come forward to make an amnesty application and an apology. And more of that, more of setting, um, setting responsibility of people who were in leadership or who were in, in the forefront of the struggle would, I think, have made a very big difference. And from the point of, would have, you know, we only had altogether uh, 7,100, I think, and 16 amnesty applications. And when people reject the TRC because it was forever letting everybody off the hook, of those 7,000 plus, 1,100 received amnesty. Um, many of the others were people who either didn't make a full disclosure or they were looking for amnesty for something that fell outside our criteria. It was perhaps something that had more of a criminal than a political motive. Um, some of those applications came from people who were already serving sentences in prison. And we worry a bit about them because probably they didn't have access to legal advice or to very good legal advice. And maybe if they had filled in their application forms for amnesty, couching what they had done better to match the TRC provisions, they might have um, been considered for amnesty. But in any case, when you, when you measure that against the 22,000 victims, it's a drop in the ocean. And so that story remains really incomplete. And I think that's a, an imbalance to the TRC, which uh, would have changed if people had been more willing to acknowledge what they did. 
Um, just to go back to the question of the church's involvement, there have also been amazing processes um, brought into effect, like Michael Lapsley's Institute for the Healing of Memories, which is now internationally renowned. They go all over the world teaching other people how, um, talking about their suffering, um, providing um, safe spaces in which people can talk, have made a big difference. And I think that kind of work is, is also one of the things that enables people to come to the point where they can make an apology and where they can, where they can receive it. Sorry, the first? Um, the, my book about the Truth Commission? The Charlene Swartz one. Yes, Charlene Swartz, it is out. Um, I asked um, Clark's bookshop if they had it, um, and they said no, but they can get it. They've got it at their, at their town office. I'm sure other bookshops, oh, there you are, somebody's got it there. Is that the Conversations book? Mm -hmm. It's called Another Country. Um, and also, uh, talking about church things, um, the, the, one of the people involved in, in that restitution conference was a most rem remarkable man whose name is Dion Sneeman, who um, was a Dutch Reformed church minister in KwaZulu-Natal in a black area. And after he watched, followed the Truth Commission carefully, and he became part of the Home to All campaign that we tried to get people to acknowledge their ben the benefits they had accrued. And he then started something called the Church-Led Foundation for Restitution. And he's done some very important work with churches and set them on the road to the sort of work that they are doing, and particularly brought together the Dutch Reformed Church in Worcester to talk with the people in the Worcester Township uh, about a bombing that happened um, after 1994, I can't remember the year exactly, outside um, one of the supermarkets, deliberately designed to kill many, as many black people as possible. And um, the, obviously that caused a tremendous amount of, of pain and suffering. And um, the, the Restitution Foundation brought those communities together. The men who put the bombs were sentenced to long, long sentences and have lived um, for many years in Pretoria in jail. But eventually, the families from uh, the Worcester Township traveled to the prison in Pretoria to encounter one of those young men who wished to meet them and to make his apology. And it's an amazing story, and Dion has evolved from that experience to do a great deal of restitution work in, in other spheres. So that's, it just shows what can, what can be done. But it's long, slow work. Yes, yes, what indeed. I think that's, that's such a good example of how a country can only do what it is possible for it to do. There's no way that Rwanda could have had the resources to set up a huge and expensive truth commission. And so they used their traditional mechanisms of justice, the Gashasha courts, uh, where local people tried other local people in ways, I mean, rather like even in, in South Africa and other African countries where those traditional court mechanisms have brought a kind of justice that is appropriate to people who all know one another in the same community and have to go on living together in the same community and find appropriate mechanisms for a person to be found guilty, to make an apology, and then do something, pay back in forms of community service or, and eventually be reintegrated into that same society. And it is a remarkable way of um, overcoming the past. Sorry, I can't hear you very well. 